community. Increasing diplomacy peacefully in West Asia would entail increasing sanctions as the UNGA20 finds that sanctions are one of the most common tools of international diplomacy. This is bad for three main reasons. The first is civilians. Comprehensive sanctions, sanctions that include broad-based trade restrictions and prohibit commercial activity within an entire country are extraordinarily harmful. A lack of 14 rights that these cause economic crises and devastation to socioeconomic structures. These are the kinds of sanctions that the U.S. uses in West Asia. In Syria, the U.S. implemented comprehensive sanctions through multiple executive orders to bribe to deprive the Assad regime of resources. Problematically, Feltman 21 finds that the policy has failed to produce any behavioral changes, neither weakening core support among Assad's core, nor changing the conduct of the ruling elite. Instead, it's crippled the country's already war-ravaged economy, causing shortages in the collapse of the Syrian currency. The impact is lies. The UN 22 contextualizes that shortages caused by sanctions have caused water distribution for drinking and irrigation to stop, creating food shortages. The UN continues that over 12 million Syrians grapple with food insecurity and 90% of Syria's population is living below the poverty line with little to no access to food, water, electricity, and healthcare. Overall, Gorgi 14 quantifies that sanctions increase the overall death rate of a country by 10%. The second reason is fueling terrorism. 2013 explains that economic, terror, economic sanctions intensify economic hardships and increase levels of grievances. Economic sanctions destroy the last hope for the poor. They then either turn to terrorist violence against foreign targets or join international terrorist groups who avenge their suffering. This is exactly what happened in Iraq. During the time of US sanctions, Iraq saw an increase in international terrorism by 436%. Ultimately, in an analysis of 152 countries for the past 30 decades, shows that upon the imposition of sanctions, the likelihood of domestic terrorism increases by 149%. The impact is deaths. Altman 21 finds that when sanctions are imposed, the number of fatalities from terrorism increases. The violence from terrorist organizations is horrific. Club 16 quantifies that from ISIS alone, over 33,000 people have died from 2002 through 2015. The third reason is empowering authoritarian regimes. Bernat 18 explains that sanctions severely limit resources. He continues that this empowers authoritarian regimes as they hoard resources, ultimately making the population more dependent on them. On top of that, the imposition of sanctions brings more public support towards the target regime as they push blame outwards. Patel 14 writes that leaders use sanctions as a pretext to increase repression and tighten control. Bernat concludes that sanctioned countries grew less democratic. Historically, Arbidoff 14 explains that when West Asian regimes were sanctioned in countries like Libya, Syria, and Iran, they took advantage of the sanctions to prolong their rule. The impact is health, but Lockheed 19 writes that living in an autocratic country is horrible for health. Autocratic leaders don't have the incentive to maintain healthcare infrastructure. Finally, Besley 06 writes that the life expectancy is five years lower and the infant mortality rate is much, much higher. Lockheed continues that between 1995 and 2015, an estimated 16 million deaths were averted from democratization, shifting further into autocracy and dangerously 16 million lives. Our second contention is rebel group fragmentation, diplomacy facilitated by international mediators caused by rebel groups to fragment, caused rebel groups to fragment. Dersma 21 writes the greatest risk to peace comes from factions that break away from a rebel group and continue to fight because the peace emerging from negotiations threatens their power and their interests. Factions within a rebel group may disagree on the onset of negotiations, the conclusion of a peace agreement, or the implementation of an agreement, and thus break away during the peace process. Thus, international mediation and civil wars makes rebel fragmentation more likely. In an analysis of a global interstate conflict, Jersma quantifies that an ongoing peace process makes a rebel split nearly 1,700% more likely. Problematically, Perlman 12 finds that fragmentation increases competition within non-state actors for political relevance, increased incentives for militancy, encouraging factions to impose costs through violence. He concludes that fragmentation makes civil wars longer, more violent, and more difficult to solve. The impact is war. 115 explains that Syria is an example of a conflict prone to fragmentation, and then these types of conflicts, increases in fragmentation, lead to an increase in anti-civilian violence. Stork 20 quantifies that sanctioned rebel groups conduct approximately 7.8 times more one-sided violence in comparison to non-sanctioned rebel groups. The SOHR 22 concludes that rebel groups have killed nearly 8,000 civilians in Syria. The deaths from the ongoing violence cannot be understated. FARC 22 quantifies that 83 Syrians died with each day of war. Watson 21 concludes that at least 929,000 people have died in direct war violence in West Asia. For these reasons, we urge a negative ballot. that America will always remain involved in West Asia. France 19 explains, calls for the U.S. to disengage are common, yet interest in the region haven't disappeared. If the U.S. rushes for the exit, it may find it's pulled back under worse circumstances. Huge energy reserves, international terrorism, and interest in promoting human rights exert a strong pull on American policy, making it impossible for officials to ignore the region. Thus, the choice isn't between American diplomacy or disengagement, but rather diplomacy or violent force. Lindsay 20 confirms, in the Middle East, it's time to try diplomacy to fill a void that's often filled by military power. We must learn from our mistakes. Ahmed 16 quantifies, deaths from Western interventions in Iraq and Afghanistan could be as high as 8 million. Contention 1 is Syria. Damascus is heating up. Weiss 22 reports, recent developments can develop into a broader conflict that would be explosive for Syria and its neighbors. So why do protests, continued clashes in Iraq, and chaos in northern Syria are a time bomb. 
Without a U.S. strategy, there isn't a sliver of hope. If left to Iran, Turkey, and Russia, the country will be headed for a tragedy on the same scale in 2014 when ISIS merged. U.S. diplomatic leverage can and should be. So Rule 21 explains Washington should bargain for the phased withdrawal of forces, sanctions, and proactive approachment for buy-in from Moscow and Ankara to ensure the region's stability, a green light for talks aimed at reincorporating the Syrian state. Syrian peace is of paramount importance, as Towers 15 confirms, with millions having fled, Syria threatens the stability of the entire Middle East. High tensions coupled with increased terrorism could lead to more wars, which would continue the cycle of destabilization and humanitarian crises. Already, France 21 finds a decade of war in Syria has left nearly half a million dead. Contention to is green diplomacy. To reduce Middle East instability, diplomacy must be climate conscious. Torchstein 20 explains resource scarcity accelerated by climate change is worsening disruption in the Middle East. That's why, as the U.S. confronts internal instability, it must reckon with environmental emergencies that magnify these threats. Today's climate concerns manifest as tomorrow's crises. Specifically, Jewel 21 writes, climate change presents an opportunity for the U.S. to put diplomacy first in the Middle East. America and its regional partners possess the technical know-how to help the climate, while the U.S. can serve as a key broker. These countries will play an important role in the global energy transition. Saudi Arabia, for instance, remains the world's leading oil producer, but is also deeply involved in international climate negotiations. The U.S. should push Gulf states away from hydrocarbons. Action is essential, as Lynn Wall 21 confirms, climate change is our greatest existential threat. Furthering, between 2030 and 50, climate change is expected to cause 25, uh, 250,000 deaths per year from malnutrition, disease, and heat stress. Every fraction of a degree of warming we prevent will reduce suffering and death. Contention 3 is a Middle East monopoly. In the race for economic dominance, the Middle East is a golden goose. Al Salami 21 explains, the Middle East is the heart of the world, connecting East and West, endowed with waterways, a significant volume of global trade, and rich resources, particularly oil. Between the U.S. and China, interest intersects more than in any other region. Unfortunately, China is ahead. Goddess 21 reports, Beijing's focus on economics has allowed it to benefit from the region without being tangled up in messy politics. Beijing enjoys favorable ratings and Arab polls, while the Middle East feeds its growth ambitions. Diplomacy can even the economic playing field. Goddess 21 furthers, diplomacy could succeed where interventions fail. Beijing's mega projects are too grandiose to improve the daily lives of Egyptians or Saudis. While China looks to feed egos, the U.S. could support projects that actually improve people's lives. This approach would allow the U.S. to focus on pragmatic, positive impacts. Even autocratic leaders would welcome such an approach. It can help ward off the simmering anger of their citizens by allevi alleviating deteriorations in living conditions. Indeed, Rice 15 writes, infrastructure is key to a stable Middle East. Investments in power, water, health, and transport will accelerate inclusive growth in the region, creating conditions for peace. Failure to act will leave the U.S. on the outside looking in. Cambodia 21 explains, China's route to becoming the center of the global economy involves the ability to secure access to oil and shipping lanes in the Middle East. The costs of Chinese dominance aren't just economics. As Branch 20 explains, as China builds economic power, it will convert that into geopolitical influence, reshaping the international order to expand authoritarianism. This risks millions of lives. As Rosso 5 quantifies, the probability of civil war increases by a factor of 16 in repressive countries. More broadly, 2021 writes, the best antidotes lie in democratic institutions. Democracies don't fight each other, export extremism, or produce conflicts. Open societies incubate tech that will solve the world's most pressing problems. Thus we affirm. Um, I see, like, I think God is, like, one of the, like, second or third cards in your third century chain. Mm -hmm. Actually, do you want to do an email chain or not? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Actually, no, I'm fine. I don't think I need it. Okay. You don't need the card? Okay. You ready for cards? Sure. 
We argue that what they're, they see that oil is not a sustainable source for their economy to depend on in the future forever. And so we can argue for a gradual transition as they develop new and um, okay. more environmental technology. Cool, you can get a question. On your fragmentation argument, how does the neg solve? So I would say that like the neg doesn't have the burden to prove solvency. You just have to prove that when you affirm, you increase fragmentation. So you're saying that all the internal armed conflict, all the civil wars just go on forever? No, that's not the case. The thing is, is that when the U.S. does, like, it, when it increases diplomacy licensee through sanction, it makes it much, much worse and extends the conflict. We would say that, like, if we don't, like, cause rebel through fragmentation, stuff like that, it would obviously unnet you a lot shorter. We just have to argue that, like, we're saving more lives. So where has that been the case? We, like, okay, so, like, our, our Dersma evidence is actually really, really good because it, it's an analysis over, like, all of interstate conflicts and stuff like that. So it shows you that specifically every single instance where there has been rebel through fragmentation, like, civil wars become way more violent and they extend for a lot longer and it becomes really, really difficult. So, so if I, I could have a quick follow-up because you got one. Sure, On go Syria ahead. specifically, mm -hmm. if we don't do diplomacy, how does the conflict end? Like I said, we don't have to prove solvency as an egg. Can I get a question? Yep. Um, let's talk about like your thing about, okay, let's go to your third contention about like China. Mm -hmm. um, how does China become more authoritarian and when have they spread their authoritarianism? Um, well, so we're not saying that China itself is becoming more authoritarianism. Like we're saying that China is spreading authoritarianism to the Middle East as they pursue this infrastructure mm -hmm. in the region. How many authoritarian regimes are already in the Middle East? I don't have a specific number. Okay. I don't think that's particularly relevant. What we argue is that by building this infrastructure, they're spreading authoritarianism, and that's an existential impact because countries can't adequately respond to numerous does, threats as authoritarianism spreads. Just really quick, does yep. U.S. diplomacy like counteract this infrastructure? Yeah, so we argue that we would build infrastructure in the region, and that counteracts China's infrastructure because the United States' infrastructure can improve people's lives while China's are losing battle. Cool. Start. 
Are the overview of the brand evidence actually advocates for the negative sense that the current American policies end up preventing aggression, controlling the spread of nuclear weapons, and promoting human rights democracies? We agree that U.S. probably won't leave West Asia, but what matters is that the current status quo is actually doing really well. The outflow is when you change that with the increase of sanctions. The Lindsay evidence doesn't prove a trade-off in military and diplomatic efforts. It literally says that military aggression is ineffective. Great, we don't adver- advocate for that as a net. Even better, currently in the status quo, the U.S. is surely, slowly shifting. NPR 22 finds that after two decades of fighting in the Middle East, the U.S. Army is shifting its focus away. It won't be distracted. Disastrous like Afghanistan because the U.S. understands that they can't pull out of a region quickly like that. Their overview is mostly about why they shouldn't do military advent- intervention, which doesn't apply to our case. Now, on to Syria. Turn because Carla Tony writes that warring parties take advantage of negotiations to rearm and organize. For example, Swan 22 finds that during a diplomatic breakthrough in Yemen, the Houthis obtained an increased supply of weapons, increased military offers instead of a ceasefire occurring. Turn again because the diplomacy that the U.S. does actually makes the situation worse. Overinflated optimism from our past success has led to detrimental costs. It raises expectations that we can't deliver, and when conflict gets itself, the U.S. pours blame into other, onto other actors, inciting more violence. This is what happened in Palestine. Louis XIV writes that we blame artifacts for the summons his failure, and that became it, that made it easier for him to uh, acquiesce and to in, encourage the violence that would become the second in, in Fatato. The diplomacy that the U.S. does is ineffective because Miller 14 writes that the U.S. doesn't have the capability to solve the conflict in the region, and the U.S. no longer has reliability as an effective negotiator. Dorsey 21 finds that the U.S.'s lack of a cohesive policy coupled with concern over the reliability of the U.S. as an ally was enforced by its withdrawal from Afghanistan. The negotiations focused on getting the U.S. out of the conflict with no consideration of the consequences for U.S. allies. Even if the U.S. wants to do diplomacy, countries are no, lo- uh, no, no longer trust the U.S. to carry out negotiations, so they will not agree, agree to the no- negotiations. And then. You're going to be linking in concurrent strategies, sanctions, we make the conflict worse with increased diplomacy, and we empower authoritarian regimes instead. All this rule evidence that talks about what the U.S. should do instead of what their current strategy is. We're telling you the current strategy is increased diplomacy means increased sanctions. On the powers, evidence turn because terrorism increases with sanctions. Go to the uh, second contention about green diplomacy. First, U.S. will never put climate change first because of foreign policy. Look to like great power competition. We see they always focus on economic dominance, and you can literally cross example their, their contention three. They always focus on economic dominance. And the sprout of climate change comes from the U.S. itself. They need to deal with their own problems instead. We see that the U.S. is like the leading emitter for climate change. So if you really want to solve climate change, bring it back home. Then, um, uh, climate change is inevitable anyways. And on hydrocarbons, Saudi would never turn away from oil. It's literally their economic boom, like their economic main economic source. Go to the third contention, all right? We'll tell you first we link it in turn because we ruin these economic golden goose they're talking about with sanctions. We say that Saudi Arabia would get uh, sanctions because that's what diplomacy talks about in our world. Therefore, you're limiting their economy. Then go on because it's extra topple because they're not focusing on an internal armed conflict in their world. And then, um, and then move on. Um, uh, China and Russia cannot fill in West Asia. Hoffman 21 writes that neither Russia nor China is capable of filling the supposed U.S. void in West Asia, nor do they desire to. Moscow and Beijing have not outright challenged the U.S.-led security order in the region because they benefit from it and have supported the security umbrella for them to become more involved in the region without having to assume the cost of physically protecting their interests. Their ability to continue their low-cost maneuvering in the region would be undermined by U.S. absence. China is in uniquely no position to fill in. China's recent lift up their harsh COVID restrictions has led to a severe infection rate. The BBC quantifies today that the cases have reached 900 million. China is dealing with their own health crisis right now, international issues are not on the table right now for the country. And while there have been discussions over Chinese intervention in, for example, like Syria, this is not going to happen for two reasons. Akil 21 writes that investors don't want to get involved because of the fragmented conflict, fear of spillover or flare-ups, and the U.S. sanctions that are approved in Syria. Then you're going to have us outweighing on probability. We're telling you that sanctions are happening right now, but they're telling you what dip- diplomacy should be. We're giving the current strategy, what's happening in the status quo, so you always look to the neck for what's actually happening in the status quo, not some like dream world that the AF is advocating for. Then you're going to have us outweighing on historical precedents. We're giving you everything that has happened in the past. And for example, in uh, green diplomacy, we tell you that uh, climate change has never been the main focus for the U.S. That's why you should be engaging. is good, but that is not our argument. Our argument is that diplomacy replaces violent military intervention, which achieves the benefits while avoiding the cost. They say the military is ineffective. We absolutely agree, which is why we need an alternative to military intervention as we're doing right now. They say that we're focusing away, but the U.S. still has 30,000 troops in the region, and due to terrorism and human rights, all dropped warrants, the U.S. will inevitably engage. The difference is whether it's diplomatic or military. On Syria, we'll agree that there probably isn't any resolution of the conflict, but I'll explain why um, they're, they're not winning Syria either on their case. On green diplomacy, they say the U.S. will never put climate change first, but don't read any evidence on this. Mufsin in 2021 writes, the U.S. is in 
indispensable given its diplomatic muscle. The climate talks, while the climate talks stalled under Trump, Kerry's approach to climate put the U.S. diplomacy at the forefront. The U.S. has proud more than 100 countries to make deep cuts in emissions. Then, they say that the U.S. needs to bring it back home, but even if the U.S. never solves its own problems, at least we can help transition other countries away from hydrocarbons, which benefits U.S. national security and also helps them. They say climate change is inevitable. They have dropped in every single degree of warming we prevent saves lives. Uh, climate change will kill 250,000 people for every single year it goes on. And they say Saudi Arabia will never turn away. One, the argument is not just about Saudi Arabia. Second of all, Saudi Arabia released Vision 2030, which indicates some idea of transitioning. The difference is whether they have the economic viability to do so. The app gives them that. Lastly, on the China argument, they say sanctions ruin the golden goose. No, because we're investing in infrastructure, which proves that we wouldn't do sanctions because we want to build up the Middle Eastern economies so that we can harness the benefits of them. They say we don't focus on internal armed conflicts. We absolutely do. The rice evidence says the best way to reduce internal armed conflicts is to create conditions that help people, i.e. water, power, infrastructure, etc., that all helps people there. They say China can't fill the void. Their Hoffman evidence is from 2021. Our evidence is from 2022 and indicates that China is expanding. And it talks about security, not economics. Our entire argument is about economics, and China is expanding economically. Lastly, they say that COVID has shut it down, but COVID is temporary, and more than just COVID being temporary, China is still focusing on economics because it literally benefits their economy. So obviously they have every incentive to do so. They say they outweigh on probability. That's predicated on winning their case, and we definitely outweigh on probability because I'll explain why sanctions have actually been good historically and why diplomacy works with it. Let's go to their case. Their first contention is reliant on sanctions, but first, sanctions are non-topical. The resolution says the U.S. should increase diplomacy to quote-unquote resolve internal armed conflict. Resolved is defined by Cambridge as to solve or end a problem. This is not a goal of sanctions. Maislett writes that the U.S. now maintains sanctions to deter, coerce, signal, and or punish, none of which are synonymous with resolve. This also turns their argument. The U.S. already imposes sanctions, as proven by Syria. If the U.S. is forced to consider resolution instead of mitigation, sanctions would decrease. In fact, our full evidence from our Syria argument says that in exchange for concessions, the U.S. could ease sanctions on Assad. Second, sanctions are empirically effective. As Crane 12 writes, sanctions raise the cost of murderous policy significantly and list a litany of examples. And Sassan 17 quantifies sanctions increase the hazard rate of war termination by 97%. Lastly, sanctions aren't an issue, just how we use them. Beyond diplomacy being targeted, reform solved. O'Toole 19 writes, policy is the problem, not sanctions. Rather than throw out the tools, sanctions should be part of a diplomatic effort. There are reforms that Congress is considering in the wake of perceived misuse. Already, Burrell in 2022 writes, Congress established a review process to modify or change sanctions, illustrating refusal to acquiesce to the executive. On the terrorism argument, you can turn this against them. As Cerdo in 2015 writes that the U.S. has changed its focus toward doing diplomacy to a more gradual one focused on humanitarian assistance, reducing terrorism materially and ideologically. On authoritarianism, one, it can literally not get any worse. As Carpendell on January 5th reported across the Middle East, authoritarian ruling elites have strengthened their hold on power, blocking protests, and few demands for a bitter life have been heated at the same time the region faces mounting socioeconomic problems. And this is due to U.S. disengagement. As Yahoo 22 writes that Russia and China are filling the void, expanding authoritarianism, so the best way to reduce the effects of that is to do diplomacy. In fact, Taipei 21 writes that 79% of Arab publics support an American plan to vote democracy as a political base for their governance. On their second argument about rebel groups, number one, this argument is incredibly silly. By this logic, we would never do peace ever because rebel groups might form. But PVG 12 finds that the average annual death toll of civil conflicts drops by more than 80% if they recur after a peace agreement. So even if violence resumes, the on net amount of deaths still decrease because at least there is time for peace and time for aid again in the region. In fact, Whites in 2021 finds the US must rebuild its most effective tool in the Middle East, diplomacy. There might be opportunities for pulling competing powers out fighting and negotiating power sharing agreements. The problem is that the U.S. has not been actively involved in the region and thus pulls out periodically. If you affirm it guarantees sustained U.S. engagement in West Asia, which reduces the effects of peace agreements failing. Thank you, Carlos. Yeah. You just want to do it from the table. Yeah. Uh, can I take first? Yeah, go for it. Okay, so, again, so, like, you talk about, like, China infrastructure being bad, and that's how they, like, spread authoritarianism, and you can just hold that shit, right? But, like, won't, like, bad China infrastructure exist anyways? No, because if allies turn to the U.S., then the infrastructure isn't, like, boondoggle infrastructure, as John alluded to in First Crossfire, but infrastructure that materially improves people's lives. But, like, we're talking about China's infrastructure, like, specifically, though, like... Yeah, so... So how is their infrastructure going to get better from U.S. diplomacy? So it's because they give contracts to the U.S. The argument isn't that infrastructure is inherently autocratic, that would be a little weird, but that China, when they gain economic power, spreads authoritarianism. And we read a piece of evidence on your case saying that due to U.S. disengagement, Russia is propping up autocrats in the region. So the argument we're making is that if we rely on U.S. infrastructure, or if Middle Eastern allies rely on U.S. infrastructure, then the projects actually improve people's lives. They're not just political pawns and tools that like end up being like white elephants for these countries, but rather they actually improve their lives, which allows them to lean towards the U.S. while also moving away from. Okay, can I take a quick follow up? Yeah. If you're talking about infrastructure, and infrastructure is usually under nation building, how do you link it back to diplomacy? Yeah, so in our case, we said that um, 
the US would do infrastructure to quell unrest and tensions. Now, if you want a card specific to diplomacy, we also have a piece of evidence that says that after seeing that China is using infrastructure diplomacy, i.e. building infrastructure, giving contracts to build friendly relations with the countries, which is what they're doing, the US is getting ideas of their own to also do the same. The problem is that the current strategy doesn't focus on the Middle East, and we're saying that you should affirm to focus it on the Middle East. So infrastructure diplomacy is a type of diplomacy that the US has expressed interest in doing, it's just not doing right now, and if you vote out, they would do it. Do you have a question? Okay, uh, so I want to talk about sanctions a little bit. Would you agree that the U.S. already imposes sanctions? Yeah, but you have to look at the neg where we're saying it's scalar, so increased diplomacy means more. Okay, but you will agree that the situation on the ground is currently bad, right? Yeah, we're saying get worse. Okay, you have a question. Okay, um, all right, you talk about like how like uh, sanctions are actually effective, right? Then why aren't they effective in the specific conflict scenario you guys talk about? Which Syria? Syria. Okay, so I don't think sanctions have to work 100% of the time to be broadly effective. And the argument we're making on Syria is so that like we, should do, we should do diplomacy to remedy the effects of sanctions. Like, the U.S. is already imposing sanctions. If you vote after changing something, you're by nature resulting in an increase in something. And yeah, our evidence says that we could leverage our sanctions. For example, um, the evidence gives the example of easing sanctions on Syria to get concessions from Assad. Okay, which like why hasn't that happened yet, though? Because we are not doing diplomacy in West Asia. But we have... The resolution is calling for increased diplomacy. Does yeah. that mean we have no dis diplomacy? Well, the diplomacy we are doing is pretty shallow, piecemeal, and largely ineffective thus far. And we're also saying that sanctions, although a diplomatic tool, um, aren't topical under the grounds of the resolution. We can have that debate later, though, because we're basically at it. Yeah. It's going to start on the observation and then we'll go to um, our things. tells you why the U.S. will always be in the Middle East is currently supporting the status quo, meaning that we're actually, the status quo is actually doing really, really well and it's stopping like the proliferation of a lot of like nuclear weapons and stopping aggression and it's promoting more peace and democracy. But then they just tell you that like, yeah, like diplomacy replaces military. But look at their Lindsay evidence. Their Lindsay evidence never proves that there's an actual trade-off, which means the app is not actually getting rid of like the military stuff. They're just increasing like stuff like sanctions or increasing whatever diplomacy they're doing. It's alongside of military. But then, let's go on to our side. We're winning our second contention about rebel fragmentation. And Jerusalem finds that the international mediators are notorious for causing rebel fragmentation as peace processes drive wedges between rebel groups. It's so drastic that ongoing peace talks increase the likelihood of fragmentation by 1,700%. Problematically, Perlin continues that fragmentation increases the violence of civil wars and would explain that more fragmentation means increased competition between groups, which only increases the death toll and extends the conflict. The impact is more increased fragmentation, skyrockets civilian violence. Watson 21 finds that only 920. 929,000 people have died in direct war violence in West Asia. They have a few responses here. First, they tell, okay, uh, yeah. First they say that like, um, 
oh like like they like they're on net it's like a lot better but what they do is like they can see the endorsement evidence which is really really good because it's very holistic it shows you that when you have rebel group fragmentation it extends the time of war it increases the amount of civilianness and it makes it way harder to solve so even if they tell you that they're saving more lives the thing is that you're extending the length of war which means there's always going to be way more economic disasters people are always going to be like falling back into like this intergenerational poverty trap that they're never ever going to be able to escape but then also that like even if like you think that they're saving like more lives like it just doesn't matter because when it's like way more violent, even if it's for shorter periods of time, it's still going to affect people really violently. But then let's go, oh, then very quickly on sanctions. Um, we'll concede the fact that like sanctions like are easing right now, so that kicked us out of that. And also like for terrorism, we'll concede that like ISIS is like an idea, you can't fundamentally like defeat it, like whatever, like the US diplomacy doesn't really work. Okay, but then let's go on to their side. Let's look at their second contention on green diplomacy. They just get up here and tell you that we don't provide you any evidence. I feel like we don't really have to provide you any evidence insofar that you can just look at like the current US policy when it comes to like green diplomacy. One, currently right now Congress is split, right? The US is never going to ever pass any kind of green diplomacy stuff because it's not bipartisan. Second, like we've pulled out of so many like agreements. Third, is that like even when we're a part of all of these agreements, we've never actually reduced like our carbon emissions. One, we've never we never put a carbon tax on our like gas and stuff like that. There's no fines for like if you like have an increased carbon footprint. We're actually not doing anything for that right now. But then they concede the fact that it's currently non-unique because climate change is inevitable. But then let's go on to the third contention about China. One, we would say that like um, like right now, we can see the BBC evidence that currently right now, COVID is like the really the really big issue for China right now, which means they can't fill in. But also it postdates all of their stuff about like how China doesn't want to fill in right now because it happened literally last week. And also COVID has like a lot of like deep economic like um, like damages and stuff like that that China will ultimately have to deal with after. Even if they come out of the COVID pandemic, they still have to deal with a lot of domestic problems that COVID actually causes, which means they're never actually going to fill in. But then also like all of their infrastructure building, like they can see it in Cross and in uh, Summary, is that, sorry. Um, it's, it's that like it still exists, like all their impacts still trigger no matter what. We'll take some prep starting.
Carter will be in arcade decades. Is everyone good? Okay. Extender Argonaut Middle East Monopoly. West Asia is the center of US China economic competition, geographically bridging the East and West while hosting rich resources vital for global expansion. However, China is taking the lead, economically engaging with Arab partners and fueling its power <coughs> without political compromise. Increase American diplomacy in the form of pragmatic infrastructure projects with quell protests and improve everyday lives, allowing the US to turn even autocrats into economic allies. Absent engagement, China will convert its economic power and its geopolitical influence, expanding authoritarian practices worldwide, and dramatically increasing the incidence of civil war, risking millions of lives. Moreover, the antidotes to terrorism conflicts and most of the world's pressing problems lie in democratic in institutions. Group both of their response about COVID. First, they've dropped that COVID is a temporary problem, so even if that's right now, that doesn't dispute the broader trend that China is getting engaged and spreading authoritarianism in the region. And then second, they've dropped that uh, by pursuing this infrastructure, that improves China's economy, so they still have an incentive to do it, even if COVID is damaging their economy now, and that's why they are pursuing it now. Third, they've also dropped that it's a diversionary tactic, so when China's facing problems domestically, they'll turn abroad and form diversionary tactics over to distract their people from the problem. They're still spreading their infrastructure, the rest of the link goes conceded. Um, they also consider evidence from December 12th that says China is doing this now. We have way for a few reasons. First, we have way because authoritarianism increases the likelihood of civil war by 16 times. This outweighs on a global scale because we're talking about, they're talking about civil wars within the Middle East, but we're talking about increasing civil wars globally as China expands authoritarianism. Second, we have weight on probability because the most likely form of diplomacy is infrastructure because that's what we would do because that's the way we can turn these countries to our allies. Uh, they've given no examples of where diplomacy has led to this fragmentation specifically in the Middle East. Then we have weight third because infrastructure creates the resources and living conditions for peace within the Middle East, which prevents these civil wars because even if like these groups aren't negotiating with each other, as we improve living conditions by building infrastructure, the whole conflict will settle down because people don't feel like they have as much to fight over. And then fourth, uh, yeah, we have weight. Uh, actually, then they say that this would ripple globally. However, just because it, like COVID will ripple, that doesn't mean it precludes China from investing in the region. Then on sanctions. First, they've dropped sanctions are non-T, so we're not talking about sanctions. Then on their fragmentation argument. Most importantly, they've dropped that when the United States pursues diplomacy, even if the peace negotiation fails, civil conflicts drops by death and civil conflicts drops more than 80% if they recur after a peace agreement. So what if the conflict lasts on a longer and it expands the time frame if people aren't dying? For example, the Cyprus conflict has lasted for over 30 years, but people aren't dying because we negotiated these peace agreements through diplomacy. They've also dropped that the situation on the region is getting worse now, so we should try to do something rather than just do nothing and let it continue to get worse. Then lastly, they've dropped our white's evidence that says the US's most effective tool in the region has been diplomacy. You should prefer a diplomatic solution because that's the most effective tool we have into getting these conflicts solved, then they're going to say, you lead to fragmentation. However, the problem why we lead to fragmentation has been a piecemeal and inconsistent approach. The app argues for an increased commitment to diplomacy that would be more consistent and prevent this fragmentation. The problem why we lead to fragmentation is because we're negotiating with certain groups, but we're not really negotiating with them, and then we go back and forth as regimes change. We argue for increased diplomacy and a consistent approach. This prevents the fragmentation they're talking about. says that one of China's big goals, both geopolitically and economically, is to win over allies. The way to do that is by instituting and supporting authoritarian leaders. Um, when China gains economic influence, the brand government says, quote, that they will use that to expand authoritarian influence across the world, and that's bad because it leads to an increased incidence of civil war. Authoritarian governments, we both agree are bad, like you said, that like mm -hmm. democracy yeah. saves 16 million lives, right? So that's kind of how we're getting there from there to there. Well, how does infrastructure tie into the picture? Well, our evidence says that the way China becomes a superpower is by gaining economic prowess, and that the Middle East is particularly important for that. It is one of the regions where oil is most prominent mm -hmm. and has big ports, so China is investing substantially in there. If we can cut off China's ability to expand via the Middle East and West Asia, we can cut off a large part of their ability to expand authoritarianism globally. Got it. Sorry, do you have a question? Yeah. Okay, so for rebel group fragmentation, mm -hmm. What's an example of a group in West Asia that's been fragmented? In Syria, like uh, all of like, the Syrian forces, like the SDF, the YPG, the PKK, all in Syria. Okay, but and like, how much has violence increased? Um, like in Syria? Yeah. I mean, like we give you evidence, like 
take your serious diet every single day. And also, like our specific okay. evidence is that like stork visits are seven point eight times more likely to be like that kind of stuff. So yeah. Um, can let's actually let's talk about like um. Okay. Uh, do you have a question? Do you have another question? No, no, no. Uh, yeah. Let's talk about how much does the time frame increase like when we pursue like diplomacy. Like how do we quantify that? I'm not sure. I mean like are there some evidence like just tells you that it just gets a lot longer and it just prevents like conflicts from being solved in general. That's what it does, yeah. Um how was your day? That's my question. Good. Uh y'all we're, we're doing good, I guess. Um we have like forty seconds we just want to run. Um actually well, I, I, if it's all right, I can check out a question on the, the rebel groups argument. Mm -hmm. Um, so when you say they fragment, what does the process of fragmentation look like? So, like, during a negotiation, or like the onset of negotiation, or implementation of the negotiation, like, within rebel groups, you have to understand that there's a lot of, like, different, like, ideologies, ideology, ideas in a rebel group, right? So, a lot of the times is that, like, there's certain factions within the rebel groups that don't agree about, like, the terms of, like, an agreement, or, like, if it's being implemented or not, so during the peace process, they end up splitting because they just don't want to be a part of it. Start with the overview. Oh, I Start with their overview, and then I'll be going to uh, our overview. Yeah. Start with the overview. You're gonna have us winning this round because again, they can see the brand's evidence that tells they give you that tells you that the status quo is actually well right now, and there's no need for increased diplomacy. This prerects all their arguments because they cannot provide you actual uniqueness to why we need increased diplomacy. And then. You also extend the Lindsay evidence they give you, which says that there's no, they cannot prove a trade-off between military and diplomacy. Now go on to our argument. Again, Judge, you're gonna have us winning on our rebel group fragmentation because we're telling you that Dersma finds that international media is notorious for causing rebel group fragmentation as the peace process drives wedges within rebel groups. It's so drastic that ongoing peace talks increase the likelihood of fragmentation by 1,700%. This is really bad. We see in Syria that te uh, uh, terror, rebel groups are reigning terror in Syria and they're contributing to civil war. Increasing diplomatic negotiations means that you're just making the conflict a lot worse. Let's talk about responses, right? First, you're always gonna extend Dersma, which tells you that we, um, in Syria, you see uh, rebel groups reigning terror and because of this sanction uh, place and uh, this place that has diplomatic negotiations in place we see that uh, conflict has rose seven to eight more times you always outweigh on historical precedents and you always look to the status quo first don't let them use cyprus always look to what's happening in the status quo because that's what is most important because that's current strategy then they're always going to outweigh because they have no warrant of consistent diplomacy. We're telling you diplomacy right now is really bad. That's why you always look to the neg first. Then, oh, um, go on to their uh, argument, all right? They talk about uh, the monopoly. Again, you're going to... Um, and you're going to extend the post date about China. We're telling you in the status quo, China cannot even get to the negotiating table because of the uh, crisis that's happening at home. They need to stay at home because they need to focus on their problems first. And COVID is long term. They cannot prove to you why COVID is short term. And then... You're going to be taking this whole argument out because of that. And you're going to, uh, we pre right here because you can't even have China a uh, access the negotiating table in the first place. You also have, so, also have us outweighing on uh, probability. We see what's happening right now. That's why we have the cleanest dollar in the round. West Asia is the center of the U.S.-China economic competition, geographically bridging the east and west while hosting rich resources vital to global expansion. However, China is taking the lead economically engaging with Arab partners and fueling its...
turn even autocrats into economic allies. Absent engagement, China will convert its economic power into geopolitical influence, expanding authoritarian practices worldwide, and dramatically increasing the incidence of civil war, risking millions of lives. Their only response is that COVID bogs them down. But ask yourself why. We have said that China is expanding the Middle East to improve their economy. It gives them economic influence. Moreover, the domestic and foreign policy situations in countries can be different. The US still has a foreign policy despite being bogged down via COVID, which should prove our argument to be true. Our entire point is that to divert away from the crisis at home, China is engaging economically. More important than that, we have heard evidence from December 12th saying China is actively involved in the Middle East. There are evidences that China is dealing with problems at home, not that they're not involved in West Asia, so ours is far more preferable. If we win this voter, we win the round. They have dropped all of the weighing we gave, that A, authoritarian governments increase the incidence of civil war by 16 times. Their entire argument is about rebel group fragmentation. The only reason there are rebel groups is because Syria is a civil conflict. If authoritarian governments are increasing worldwide, that means more fragmentation and more deaths. They've also dropped that because the most probable form of diplomacy is infrastructure diplomacy, it quells protests, gives people drinking water, access to electricity, etc., all of which dramatically decrease the likelihood that people are dying on the battlefield and increase the chance of peace. Let's go to their case. The second voter is their own argument about the idea of rebel groups. The only thing they really have to say about the status quo being good is the overview, but this, like, this is like making their sanctions argument a voter. We're not going for it. They're not either. On the argument itself, they have agreed that the peace process is worth trying. Even if we extend the conflict, the number of casualties gets reduced by 80% because it gives time for aid to go in. More than that, the app guarantees a consistent form of diplomacy. Our evidence says that America's most effective tool has been diplomacy. Even if the peace process increases fragmentation, it reduces deaths on net. Our evidence is far more realistic, and our logic is as well. Good round, y'all. <laughs> Yeah, great job. Uh, could I see the, uh, I think on y'all's side, it was like 80% less deaths from rebel conflicts after mediation. And then on your side, I think it was something along the lines of uh, mediators increased violence by 170%. Yeah. So I understood that. Oh, was it 1,700%? Yeah. Okay, so I decided uh, to vote for the app side uh, in this round. It was a very close round. It really was. Great job to both of you, or to all of you. Uh, really good job speaking, you know, outlining your arguments uh, all around a great debate. Uh, the main reason, or th there are several reasons, I'll just go through them really quick. Uh, for the next time, uh, the first, you know, the first contention, the large part of your arguments was about sanctions, and then when that was dropped, I heard you, you know, a good bit. Uh, and then the fragmentation argument kind of became a slugfest in a way because you guys had the card where you're saying you know fragmentation will increase after uh, a peace deal, but then the you know 80 percent less deaths card kind of makes it more questionable. Uh, and then uh, the green diplomacy and Middle East monopoly uh, contentions on this side, uh, I thought were pretty strong, and some of the responses to it uh, weren't quite as strong. Uh, you know the the main responses I picked up in rebuttal was that you know, climate change is inevitable and uh, 
you know, China isn't won't meddle in international affairs because it has problems at home. But when they're saying in case that you know China is uh, meddling as we speak, that kind of you know makes that argument questionable. Um, so yeah, for those reasons, I ended up going with that. Uh, I'll type out more you know detailed notes uh, in the uh, ballot. Uh, and my email is in my paradigm, so if you guys have any specific questions, uh, feel free to reach out. Sure, thank, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.